Motas Tabanakus, see, welcome in to a bonus edition of the Worst Fantasy Show. Scott Fishbowl drafts are kicking off tomorrow for many of us. I know my Joker division is kicking off the slow draft for Scott Fishbowl 14 starting tomorrow at 10 a.m. So I thought it would be fun to take a little look back and walk down memory lane and check out last year's draft, uh, which uh, was for Scott Fishbowl 13 for me, was also from the 106, the same position I'll be drafting this year. Uh, but uh, this was in the Dominoes division last season. So I'll pull it up right here. And again, you can see I was at the 106 in last year's Dominoes division, a 22-round draft. And we started with Justin Herbert. So last year, we kept it very uh, traditional in the sense of we went with the quarterback first uh, in a super flex league. Uh, Justin Herbert obviously had his struggles and issues. Uh, however, I mean, Joe Burrow went immediately after. So really wasn't like uh, I, I could have benefited from taking Burrow instead. And then you look at Lawrence and Fields were the next two quarterbacks off the board. So even with his struggles, I feel like Justin Herbert was the right decision there, unless I was just going to go uh, completely uh, punting on a uh, quarterback and a super flex and deciding to take them later. Uh, I could have gone with one of the big wide receivers uh, or Christian McCaffrey. It didn't turn out that way. I ended up going with the quarterback. This year, I'm at that 106. I can tell you I am not taking a quarterback. Uh, just the way that the board sets up, I basically, unless one of my big four were to fall to me, uh, which uh, is Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes, and Lamar Jackson. If for the sake of argument, one of them were to follow me at 106, okay, fine. Twist my arm about it. I would, I'll probably take them. However, uh, it's, I'm not going to be reaching on any of the other quarterbacks that come after that, uh, including – I know people are very enamored by Anthony Richardson, who often goes uh, – and because of the Scott Fishbowl scoring format that really benefits the Russian quarterback, I can see people making that reach. I won't be doing that personally. I can tell you, if Christian McCaffrey is on the board, I'm probably going to go with Christian McCaffrey. Otherwise, I'm – I'm actually one that might jump on Bijan a lot earlier than other people because I believe he can have a transcendent season this year. Uh, so going with my next picks, A.J. Brown and Garrett Wilson. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers, uh, his injury really uh, made Garrett Wilson struggle. He did not have the type of season that we were all expecting. It seems like most people are back in on Garrett Wilson because, it, if anything, I don't think he's even lost any value. He might even be going a little bit earlier than this in drafts this year. Um, and I, I think that it's the exact same risk that exists as last year. So Garrett Wilson, probably not someone I'm trying to get uh, again this year. But A.J. Brown, I, I know he declined towards the end, as did all of the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm totally fine hammering him again. In fact, I think he's a value this year. It's starting to creep up because people are starting to realize like, oh, A.J. Brown on a down year had 1,500 yards. Uh, but I really believe in A.J. Brown just as a talent, so I would be willing to draft him again. And then we start getting into the meat of the draft, and this is where it was very hit or miss for me. Um, Najee Harris obviously struggled mightily throughout the year, did not really pick things up until the end of the season. Jordan Love as my second quarterback in a super flex in the fifth round, that was an absolute hit. He was fantastic uh, last year. But Christian Watson was not the reason why, and um, I had gone with that stack. I felt really good about it, but unfortunately, obviously, Christian Watson, hampered by his injury history, was not uh, readily available or relevant for most of the season. And even though there was a tight end premium, I waited on tight end, and I actually ended up with Evan Ingram, which 
ended up being an excellent selection uh, because Evan Ingram, uh, I believe, led all tight ends in receptions last year. Uh, he was tremendous um, as far as a fantasy presence for the tight end room, and especially because when you look at last year and how crazy it was with people reaching on tight ends, and it's going to be similar this year. You look at Travis Kelsey at that 104 spot. Um, again, looking at the draft, Dominate FF, shout out to you, my man. He had gone with the double tap tight end of Mark Andrews and Hawkinson. So tight end premium, and especially this year now it's triple tight end premium, is going to drive these tight end prices up. And so if you're able to find the value on the Evan Ingram guy this year, which is basically the last tight end that you can draft that has the potential to be a top five guy. I, I like that. And to me, that person is Jake Ferguson. I view Jake Ferguson as having potential of finishing top five. He's generally going as one of the last premier tight ends that's getting drafted. You are probably going to have to take them in the fifth round this year because all the tight end prices are getting driven up. So don't be caught waiting too long on tight end this year. There's going to be a huge cliff. I feel like after, Njoku, Friar Muth, and Jake Ferguson. Continuing on, Alvin Kamara um, in the eighth round. That was a smash pick for me. I never had any illusions that Jamal Williams or Kendra Miller were going to usurp that role from him for the entire season. Um, and I figured as soon as he came back, he would be right back into his role that he normally is. Uh, he got it done mostly as a PPR back last year, and it was grossly inefficient. Uh, some people may think he's lost a step. I don't think that's the issue. I think this team is just awful. Uh, and I don't really see anything that's changed this year. So I'm still willing to take shots on Camara, but I don't have him on a lot of rosters, admittedly, this season. Quentin Johnston, I mean, that was the stack with Herbert uh, and the upside potential, but we all know how that failed spectacularly. Chigo Conquo, I feel like. Uh, a lot of people were really in on Chigo Conquo last year, and it didn't really pan out. And I feel like people are kind of faded on him this year because now you have DeAndre Hopkins and – or sorry, Calvin Ridley uh, and Tyler Boyd coming into the scene with DeAndre Hopkins already there. So you could argue he's now fourth or fifth uh, in terms of, like, mouths to feed in that offense. It would be interesting to see if he's the one that's able to have a breakout this season when people are really not expecting it. I took Jamal Williams here uh, primarily because I obviously wanted to handcuff. I thought he would be the lead back for the first three weeks. Uh, I was betting that it would be him and not Kendra Miller. And honestly, neither of them were really valuable at all for the three weeks, even though Camaro was missing. And I thought... Uh, even when Kamara came back, if there was someone that was going to mix in on the goal line, kind of in the same role that he had just left in Detroit, I thought it could be Jamal Williams. Didn't work out. And in the 11th round, it's actually a pretty high pick for a handcuff, even one that I saw as being a viable starter for the first three weeks and having a role still thereafter. This kind of reminds me of, it's about the same range of, if you have to take Kyron Williams early, if you're the Kyron Williams owner, by about this round, you should be looking real hard at Blake Corum. Even if it doesn't necessarily work out, it you're ensuring the spot. In the sense of, you know, when I did this, I was basically telling myself, and, and I took the bet that Kendra Miller wasn't really going to be involved, but I bet on... New Orleans backfield, but primarily through Camara. And then this is where I started hitting on some late sleepers. Uh, Devon A. Shane and Devin Singletary uh, obviously were uh, very valuable, uh, especially A. Shane would have monster games, and then Singletary was kind of more of like a plotting character um, that provided good depth for my team. I took the kicker early because the ticker, uh, the kickers uh, really get a lot of points in Scott Fishbowl, so I had taken Justin Tucker. Last year, there was only one kicker spot. This year, if you're playing on MFL, there are kicker flex spots. So theoretically, you could just have like five kickers in your lineup, I think. I don't know if I would do that, but it'd be, it'll be funny to see if that's a viable strategy. 
Trey Lance was obviously a swing and a miss, but uh, in Superflex, uh, it's funny. I took the bet that Trey Lance or Sam Darnold were going to be able to beat Brock Purdy because, you know, Purdy was literally Mr. Irrelevant, the 32nd uh, pick in the seventh round, last pick in the NFL draft. So I thought Trey Lance was ultimately going to be the starter and Sam Darnold would actually present as the backup with Brock Purdy kind of being like the third guy mixing in. Obviously, that's not what happened. And so it blew up both of those picks. But ultimately, they were really late picks anyways. When you're talking about the 15th and 20th round, those were not hurting me. But getting Trey McBride in the 16th round, that was that was a coup de grace. This was quite literally one of the reasons between uh, McBride, A. Shane, and then I was also able to get Puka Nakua early off waivers and then attacking waivers all year because you can't make trades in Scott Fishbowl. Uh, because of those reasons, I was able to get to the semifinals in my first year. And then I ended up losing uh, in the semis. And then rounding out this draft, John Mechie was more of a heart pick. Jacoby Brissett, Michael Carter, Sam Darnold, Isaiah Hodgins, Foster Moreau. So those are all, I mean, really late shots. You're not usually finding true value in these rounds anyways. Uh, knowing what I know now about Scott Fishbowl, though, I would have taken probably all tight ends with those picks. Um, so I think this year that is one strategy that I'm going to be looking at is when I get into those final rounds, I am going to be looking at some tight ends to take the shot on. We're going to pull back a little bit here so that we can still see the draft board, but I wanted to be able to get the whole draft board in place. And just very quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just kind of looking back on the actual draft itself and how it fell. Uh, Mahomes at 101, Josh Allen 102, Jalen Hurts at 103, and Travis Kelsey as high as 104. So it, you were not getting Mahomes Kelsey stack last year. It's possible if Mahomes makes it to me at 106 that Kelsey could also make it to me at 27, and that could end up being a stack I take. Honestly, if I'm uh, – I think the problem is that you're not going to get Mahomes past 106, and you're not going to be able to then get Travis Kelsey for the most part if you took Mahomes in one of those first four picks. I really think Travis Kelsey is probably going to be going – if not at the turn, you know, in those first six picks after the turn, definitely not making it past me if I end up having to be the Mahomes pick. So that's just kind of looking at this year, how the first and second round are already changing. But a lot of familiar names, obviously, with Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Christian McCaffrey. The one big one, Austin Eckler, obviously had a terrible season, dropped completely out of the first round now finds himself in Washington and uh, going much later in drafts as a potential value if he's able to land a starting job and be even a facsimile of what he was before. Um, Cooper Cup also with the injuries gets knocked down a little bit. Justin Fields, obviously. TJ Hawkinson also injured. Uh, so they're not in the first or second round anymore. Stephon Diggs with the way that his season ended uh, – got knocked out a little bit. You see Deshaun Watson, obviously injured and had a bad season. His value has decreased. And so some of these guys that have been pushed up, obviously you look at like Brees Hall, Travis Etienne, Jameer Gibbs. These were all fourth rounders last year that are potential first and second rounders this year. Um, you look at some of the quarterbacks like Jordan Love is going to be going much higher. Kyler Murray is going to be going higher this year. Um, so just a lot of intricacies. And the other thing I wanted to look at real quick is how many viable true starters were there really in those last five rounds after I took McBride? Cause it, I basically had all swing and a miss picks and yet still made the semifinals. So it's, again, you don't win at the draft, but you can lose at the draft. So those, the, that first half of the draft, Really a big struggle, but then you look at kind of the, where the sleepers were in this draft. You know, I look at Jaden Reed and Jake Ferguson that I went after my John Mechie pick. I look at 
Rashid Shahid is going to be a big value this year. Um, I look at, uh, you know, Luke Musgrave and it ended up being Tucker Craft, which I got off waivers were valuable. Hunter Henry in this format with the triple tight end premium also should not be overlooked as a late sleeper. Um, Tank Dell, obviously, in the 21st round is hilarious. Uh, that was obviously a major hit. Um, so there, there are guys few and far between, you know. Uh, and then in between that, you'll have all the irrelevant jabronis that let us down like every other year. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to take a quick look back on Scott Fishbowl 13 and my draft from last year. I always like to do this because I like to look at my previous drafts and kind of see, you know, what was I thinking and what was my strategy and where did I maybe go wrong and how can I maybe make some adjustments going forward. Not that this translates directly, obviously, to Scott Fishbowl 14, but it just gives you kind of a little bit of an idea of, you know, where you've been so that you can know where you're going. That's it for me on this little bonus episode. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, if you guys, I don't do uh, sponsors or ads or anything, but if you can go make a donation to fantasycares.org, that is the charity uh, behind Scott Fishbowl. That's where all of the donations are going. They help support uh, things like uh, gifts for kids around the holidays, uh, stuff we can all get behind in terms of charity. It's nice to um, be supportive in the fantasy community space. So uh, if you guys can go make a donation, again, fantasycares.org. Go give uh, Fantasy Cares a follow on Twitter, uh, Scott Fish uh, and the team a follow on Twitter. Uh, at the same time, drop an elbow, super kick that subscribe button for us too. Hit that like button, drop some comments, mess up the algorithm. But until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side.